Great. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to the session. Um, super happy that um, you're all here. Um, and uh, even happier to see Rebecca and all the students in the classroom. Thank you guys for making the time to connect with all of us teachers and scientists outside of Norway. Um, at the moment, I am at the European Geosciences Union Conference in Vienna. Rebecca, your teacher, might have already told you. Um, and we are carrying out this session called Teacher Scientist Pairing Scheme, where your teacher and a scientist, Claudia, here, uh, will teach a lesson plan together. A lesson plan that they have uh, practiced together and, um, and a lesson plan that um, your teacher developed actually a year ago when she was on an expedition to the Arctic Ocean. I'm sure you know about that already. So um, let's um, just talk a little bit about what this uh, scheme, which is a teacher scientist pairing scheme looks like. So here you can see a picture of a classroom very, very far from where you are. This is in Tajikistan, a country in Central Asia. And, uh, and you see students working in groups with their teacher in the middle. And then if you look very carefully in the background, you see a screen with a video teacher joining the classroom virtually, just like Claudio today. So this is what pairing teaching scheme looks like. The scientist and the teacher comes together to bring hopefully very interesting information to you in the classroom. So just a quick background that how today's session is gonna go. So we are going to use a technique called pair teaching where we will show you um, some uh, virtual segments of a scientist, uh, Claudio, introducing some of the topics that you're going to explore later today with the help of your teacher in the classroom. And this lesson is quite unique because it's interactive. Um, there's not a lot of lectures here, so you're not just sitting there listening to some boring people talking to you, but you're actually talking to each other, you're using different types of maps, looking as, at, at them and discussing them together with your friends and with your teacher. Um, some of these activities might be a little bit challenging. I will be very curious to see um, what you think about them. Um, and hopefully um, you get a chance to also ask some questions uh, of the scientists who are here, uh, especially Claudio, who is more than happy to answer your questions. If you are interested in checking out some of the previously recorded lesson plans, just like the one you're doing today, but different topics in science, there are some links there, and I'm sure your teacher can later share these links with you. But there are some really cool videos out there on all kinds of different topics, from earthquakes to um, volcanoes um, to oceans, anything pretty much related to natural sciences. And also a boring article, maybe, for many of you, but it's here. Um, this article was, was published um, sharing the results of how this kind of technique can actually be used in different places around the world. And in a way, it's really nice because in some countries, um, people don't have direct access to scientists. So many students like you have a very difficult time ever coming into contact with an actual scientist in their school. So one way to uh, help with that is to bring the scientist via a video into their classrooms. And then the scientist can be anywhere in the world. Of course, if that scientist speak the language of those students, that's really, really great. But if they can't, maybe there's a translator or an interpreter uh, that can help with that. But it's a technique that can be used almost anywhere. And today, um, I think you know that we are going to talk a little bit about the Arctic Ocean. Um, and you are very familiar with the Arctic region uh, being in Torobsoy. And Vibeka is going to take you together with Claudio on a journey to a cold seep. Um, I'm not gonna say much about it um, because they're gonna explain to you what a cold seep is and why they're important. And uh, more uh, even interesting, why do scientists actually study them and how they study them? So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and give the floor to 
Claudio, who is going to kickstart the lesson. Yeah, thank you, Solmas, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm uh, currently at the Department of Geoscience here in Tromso, so we are not far apart, actually. And I'm a researcher, so I'm a scientist. I'm doing science as a researcher, and I'm spending uh, uh, most of the time during the year on, on ship, so research expedition in the Barents Sea, at sea, collecting samples, and uh, working on this type of environment called cold seeps. So I will start sharing immediately my, my PowerPoint, because we need to know and to understand what is a cold seep. This is the first question we have for you, actually. So this is a video that we recorded uh, during one of these uh, research expeditions that I participated in. So I want you to watch this video and uh, try to figure out what is this uh, changing color that you see immediately, like there's there's quite a range of colors in this video and uh, mostly from brown to gray, white. So what is it? What is it that you're looking at? This tube here, this plastic liner is just, is just a way to collect sediment core. And we are using this robot here actually to collect it. And yeah, so I want you and, and Vibeke will uh, take the lead now I want you to keep looking at this video and trying to describe what you see and trying to figure out what it can be. Yeah. So I think, Vibeke, uh, I, I can uh, pass the ball to you now. Mm -hmm. And I will just keep the video going. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Allez, il y a travail. And uh, be Be back. I just wanted to add uh, one one detail. Okay, for example, it's still on. We'll like it in the tall. Okay. Yeah. Just one important details. Uh, detail. You see here, there's two laser points uh, here. One here and one here. This gives you the scale of the of the imagery you're seeing. This is 15 centimeter distance. And that might help you understand what these things are. Yeah. Claudio, 
Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I got some response now, and they um, they think that it's uh, I have several actually. So some of them think it's uh, oil. Uh, some think it looks like uh, South America, the shape of the stain. Some maybe think it's some metal, and uh, some think that you take some uh, tests from the uh, sediment. Um, you may pay them as well. Non true metal, uh, methane. Some think it's methane. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that's all quite. Uh, correct uh, answers, I would say. Um, uh, there is actually no oil in here. So these black patches on, on the seafloor is actually not oil, crude oil, but it's just sediment, very dark sediment because there's no oxygen in it. The oxygen has been consumed by this white uh, mat. Uh, this is actually um, composed of microbes, microbes, forming a mat on the seafloor. And they are consuming all this oxygen and other components in the sediment, turning the color of the sediment to black like this. But the microbes itself, they, they are just whitish or grayish. That's just their color. And they are very fluffy. You see that there are some flakes moving around when we are doing the coring. So they are very fragile, actually. And we also have some tube worms here, some other organism, long tubes sticking out of the sediment. These are other organisms inhabiting this habitat. Uh, you are correct, there is methane. Sometimes we see bubbles of methane escaping the sediment. And here we go, we have a cold seep environment, an environment, a marine environment, where there's some methane escaping the sediment or methane charged sediment and the cold seep environment are typically inhabited by these communities in the arctic white microbial mat so microbes consuming methane and oxygen and these uh, tube worms here forming these bushes of tube worms so here we go uh, you got the definition of a cold seep environment now I just uh, want to give you some information for the next task, actually. So here we go. This is just another image with a, another large microbial map. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so for the next task, I know you're going to receive some maps. But in these maps, there's some name, some terminology that I want to briefly explain. Well, you're going to receive. Uh, a map uh, regarding bathymetry. So basically the depth of the ocean seafloor. And this is the scale. This is meters where zero means sea level. Above sea level, like uh, where we live, like continent uh, uh, and uh, uh, places exposed on land, mountains, everything is above the zero meter by definition. And everything submerged. So below the sea surface is going to be here. So this is just the bathymetry map of our planet. Another group is going to receive another map regarding total organic carbon, TOC. But OK, what is it? What is a total organic carbon? So it's a parameter that we measure in, this, in the sediment, marine sediment. So it's the um total content of carbon from organic matter organic matter uh, means living organism so it's material it's carbon coming from living organism soils trees all these organic matter but in the marine sediment you also have other organism composing the total organic carbon um, pool like phytoplankton, like this one. They live in the water column and they fly around at a certain point, they 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 die and they go down to the seafloor and they go into the sediment and form the TOC. And other species like this, foraminifera, they also have a shell, a beautiful shell actually. So these all three components, they are 
eventually going into the sediment and forming this carbon component of the sediment. Uh, there's a scale for it, TOC, weight percentage. You mean you get, uh, for instance, the, the sediment sampling that we did in the video you just watched. So the sediment, you can measure how much carbon from this organism is in the sediment by weight percentage, like in, on, in one gram, how much of organic matter is in the sediment. And this is just a scale. So high carbon content, very low organic content. This is the key to understand this method. Very briefly, the last one, one group is going to receive this map about gas hydrates. OK, this might be new to you, this term, gas hydrate is indeed a very special material, natural material. Looks like ice. You see this white chunk here is a gas hydrate. And you see also that they put it on fire. There's a flame here. Put it on fire because this ice-like material contains large volumes of methane. Large volume of methanes. And so it's easy to catch fire, actually. But this natural material, where do we find it? So in this map, you can see where natural gas hydrates like this have been recovered. It means we just like literally collected sediment with gas hydrate in it, or inferred. It means we think that in these places, red places here, there might be gas hydrate. So we just indirectly know that they are in there, but we never touched them, never collected. So yeah, you have basically to figure out um, uh, where they are mostly located and why, actually. There's a lot of ocean where we don't have gas hydrate. So yeah, I pass the ball to Vivek and you guys. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And no more, if you press and like blow that, Yeah. 
Let me see. Do you see my screen? Yeah, I see your screen. So it's very whitish over green, Greenland. So they wondered, is it because? Uh... You know, it's just a, a very strange color palette for the bathymetry, right? You said. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Over Greenland here. Yeah. You mean? yeah. Yeah. So the color that you see is just an arbitrary scale of color that yeah. someone chose. So it's not uh, for the ice or snow. It's yeah, okay. definitely this this map is not showing any snow or ice. That's an important actually information. Okay. Yeah. And they also wondered on the uh, total organic carbon, why is it black? Yeah. So here is. The continents are black because the, they have not been included in this uh, model. It's just uh, total organic carbon in marine sediment. And here, actually, there's some uh, area with no data. So it means nobody, uh, well, for this study, they didn't include data collected from these seafloor areas. This white, the Mediterranean was not included. Uh, um, yeah, Norway is here. Yeah, Barents Sea. There's every. Yeah, so it's just no data in the white. Okay. Yeah, we are ready to uh, go further. On. Okay. So, uh, apart. Uh, from these um, from these questions, uh, did did you come up with some interpretation already, or maybe in the next step we go into the interpretations? We go to the next step, I think. Okay. No questions from the gas hydrate group. 
Uh, I think that will be answered when they work together. Mm -hmm. All right. So basically now you work separately on the different maps, but uh, um, you're going to work together like on all the maps, uh, combining that together. So basically you can see some pattern of distribution, especially in the TOC map. Uh, there's some hotspot in some areas and also gas hydrate have some very um, clear distribution spatial geographical distribution so you have to figure out actually like what's driving this distribution like what are the common points in the different maps and also including the bathymetry information i think i yeah i have reported the question actually so Regarding the gas hydrate, at what depth, deep marine um, environment, or in the shallow areas of the seafloor? Uh, where do you see the most organic carbon content in the sediment um, in your map? And where do you expect to find gas hydrate and why? So these are actually the questions, I, I guess, feedback if you can. If you yeah. want to add something, you just uh, go on with it. Yeah. Um, so for the being a toilet for Schwarz, we are more get an expect for quite a bit than it's expected. So you have to get the clear, cut the young of the bar. Also, after what, the work lag. Also, Claudio, can you show the questions? Yeah. So we see the key. It's work that we are trying to be. Men först, det är klart att det blir varandra. Där är det klart att sätta en information på en grupp och svara på de här frågorna. Nu är det två grupper som har en avgång. Så här måste man dela sig upp så är det att man har tid, tid och tid och tid. Så vi två faktorer på det här. Okej. Det här är ju hur mycket som det som 
Det som skapar de resurserna som vi tränger, för exempel olja, det som skapar gasresurser som vi tränger, det är karbon. Och det här kortet här visar koncentration av karbon i det översta laget i, i det översta laget på bunn i, i hav på havbunn. Ja, Nej, så den visar liksom hur mycket karbon, hur många som, hur, hur stor del av det som är karbon egentligen. Och det, det, något som har mycket karbon har ganska stor potential för att lägga eh, resurser som vi tränger, för exempel gas. Ja, det är så. Ja. Så det röda är det mest. Det röda är det mest, ja. Men alltså är det där ni har mött var? Alltså mött var i kategorin? Ja. Ja, ofta så är det samsvar. Det bra. Ja, och det händer att det händer att sådana platser där vi vill lätta olja är platser där det har varit mycket karbon, men så har ju kontinentalplatt flyttat på sig. Så har det hamnat dyrt, det är kontinentalplatten har flyttat sig och det har flyttat sig ner. Så en gång de platser som vi nu vill lätta olja har som finns på grunna områden. För att grunna områden, så kan vi se på det kvart här. Det samsvarar det gärna med ganska det som står ofta med liksom sån en kust där du har en där. Det är liksom det du ser det här på kusten och så. För att det där är mest liv. Det är mest liv liv i havet på de grönare områdena. Där kan organismer till fotosyntes. Oh, right. Det som är så mycket. Först det att det att det är att det är att det var inte det om tror det handlar en del om det 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 man säger 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 det man det man säger det man säger det man säger det man säger det man de är de tingen som vi har lyst på, det är det som gör att vi kan få gas och olja. Exempel. Det är mycket karbon i gas och olja. Det innehåller mycket energi i karbonförbindelsen som vi förbränner. Uh, och vi ser att här så är det stora, ganska stora förekomster av karbon. Det är så långs kysta. Uh, det samsvarar ofta med grunder och områden. Ja. Och för grunder och områden i havet så kan organismer på grunder och områden som kan driva botsyntes. Så det är ofta mer liv i de grunna områdena än i de djupa områdena. Ja, det är flera som kan dö. Ja, det är ju liv på i de djupa områdena också, men bara inte lika mer. Det är ju på en måte inte så bara en kvart och fem gör. Han är här och här och här. Jag tror det blir som här. Han är där på vi inte är. Ja, men det, vi, måste, vi måste se hur det är lite karbon. Vi är inte intresserade i områden med lite karbon. Så det där, ja, ja, för att här ligger det inte lätt att det är olja. Jag tror att han har aldrig hört igen om jorden. Jag kan gå ner där och skriva ut det. Det är en konstig Jag har gått bra för att Ja, för att det är du måste ha i flera fall samtidigt. Och det är också som man må göra för att liksom finna för, för att finna vad man ska leta i det området. Det är det vi inte vet. 
Och för en svart. Och för en svart. Och för en approximately 100 kilometers meters deep. And the highest amount of carbon, organic carbon, was close to the shore. Uh, and it was also very shallow. And they put together and found out that uh, they expect to find the gas hydrates close to the shore, at, uh, relative uh, shallow water, <laughs> and uh, high amount of carbon. Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, I will just show, yeah, I will go back to these maps, actually. So as you said, uh, the most, uh, like the highest organic carbon concentration is, yeah, overall close to the continent. Um, so along the continental margins with some other hotspot, also around the equator, actually, you see here, there's a high concentration of organic carbon in the sediment. Mm -hmm. And the gas hydrates, yeah, they definitely are located at shallow depth around the continent. Uh, I would say, yeah, uh, from 400 meters to 100, uh, yeah, that's the range, more or less. And uh, now the difficult part is to understand why, right? Why do we have these hot spots of organic carbon and matching, actually, they are matching the gas hydrate distribution. This is a very important thing that we have to figure it out. Have, uh, um, do any of you, does any of you thought about that during this short uh, time you had to, to work together? They wondered why it was not any um, 
measurements for the very deep water according to these hydrates? No. Because mm -hmm. is it because we can't measure it? Is it or is it because we just it's just because they don't we don't expect to find any gas hydrate in there because uh gas hydrate so actually should should i give you the answer for that Vibeke? yeah thank you yeah okay yeah i don't want to to spoil it and so yeah so the key to understand the link between three these three maps is gas hydrate to form and to be stable they need a lot of methane in the sediment but to have a lot of methane in the sediment, you need a lot of organic carbon in the sediment because the organic carbon in the sediment get buried uh, from other sediment at a certain point. It, it, it got transformed into methane, into crude oil. So that's the answer. And why only close to the shore as you suggested because close to the shore we have the highest uh, organic fluxes into the sediment so you also have rivers discharging a lot of organic carbon and you also have a lot of sedimentation like high sedimentation rates so this organic carbon has the time to be buried by a huge pile of sediment hundreds thousands of meters in many years of course and get cooked cooked up so with temperature this organic carbon gets transformed into gas into oil and then at uh, some point it can form gas hydrates in the sediment so that's the link between these three maps yeah do you yeah do you have questions yeah, they actually have one question more they mm. wonder these microbes what do they eat yeah the one you was you saw in the video yeah yeah so these microbes they eat the methane coming up with the fluids so there's some fluid coming up and and, and bubbling out of the sediment i said before so they they need some uh, energy source to grow to thrive and to perform their metabolic processes so they gain energy from the methane oxidation so they oxidize this methane so methane is an energy source for them and they incorporate the carbon atom from the methane that they are consuming to grow up yeah not only from methane but also from organic matter a little bit to be correct but yeah so they thrive that's why you find this white microbial map in this colsip environment only or yeah mostly because you have a lot of methane coming up Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I hope this answered your question. Yeah. So we found, uh, you found the answers to the questions, to the three questions perfectly. Now I just want to leave you with some um, important concept, actually. So we have seen coal seep methane emissions methane bubbling out of the sediment of the sediment into the water column and some of it also reaches the atmosphere and that's and that might be a problem if it's too much methane into the atmosphere because it's a very strong greenhouse gas so here is just a scheme showing the contribution of methane fluxes into the atmosphere from natural sources in green and and red anthropogenic sources here so coal seeps actually fit in here natural emission from geological and oceans yeah and if you see the numbers so these numbers this flux of methane into the atmosphere is much lower than compared to the fluxes from agriculture 
uh, and other processes, but also fossil fuel production and use. There's very high amount of methane reaching the atmosphere. And so actually the question that I want to leave you with is how can we reduce these greenhouse gas fluxes into the atmosphere in our daily life? So we cannot control emission from the cold seeps, right? They are deep in the sediment, deep in the ocean, but maybe we can do something to this anthropogenic source. And I'm not giving any answer. So it's just an open question for you or to, yeah, to think about. Yeah. Thank you very much, Claudia. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I will just ask them something so uh, in the widget it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just talk to them because we have had a project on sustainable development and ask them if they had some thoughts. And they said that we wanted to maybe eat less meat, um, maybe think about what we do to the nature. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Vivekha and Claudio. Um, are there any other questions that the students would like to ask of Claudio? No. Okay, okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks so much, Rebecca, for uh, bringing your classroom and uh, thanks to all of your students for joining this session. I hope that they learned something and they found it to be interesting. Um, and if they have any questions, I'm sure Claudio is more than happy to later even uh, get in contact and answer them. And you know how to contact Claudio. So you have that connection. Yes. Elder, do you have any questions for Rebecca or the students? Yeah, I, I, I'm wondering if it's uh, usual to, to develop activities like these uh, using uh, real data, real scientific data, or you just follow the textbook that you have at school? Um, this is kind of not in the textbook, but we have uh, we try to incorporate real data into our teaching because it's a part of the curriculum, especially in mathematics. They want to use this, so um, yeah, we try to because it feels more real, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, they always agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> they are well trained. I see. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much and congratulations. All right, thank you everyone and have a good day. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.